Hello everyone and welcome to one of the final sessions of the Aspect Festival um, for 2021. We're delighted to welcome you to our session which is on the future of social science com commercialization. I know many of you are with us on Zoom but if you are on YouTube could you click on the join Zoom button which I think is on your page. So I'm Jude Robinson, I'm a professor of health and wellbeing at the University of Glasgow. I'm also a member of Aspect Consortium and have been on the Aspect um, Advisory Board for some years. And the future of commercialization is something I think that's very much concerning to the social sciences at the moment as part of wider initiatives to get the arts, humanities and social science alongside STEM engaged in commercial practices and for businesses for the 21st century. So I'm delighted to have with me today, we've got Dr. Hamish McAlpine, who's Head of Knowledge Exchange, Data and Evidence at um, UKRI. We've got Rosalind Lowe, who's Head of Policy and Engagement at NCUB. And we've got Dr. Mark Mann, who's got a very long job title, who's Social Venture Lead and Innovation Lead for Humanities and Social Sciences, and he's at University of Oxford. And the way that we'd like to organize this panel this afternoon is to ask each of our speakers to say something about what they see the future of commercialization and the social sciences and how we can begin to bridge those gaps that we all know exist between what we aspire to do, what we believe we can contribute and what actually is happening at the moment. How can we get to where we want to be? So after that, we'll have a brief discussion, but we're really keen to hear questions from you, the audience. So if you could put your questions on the Q&A, um, that would enable us at the end of the session just to wrap up with a, a fuller discussion, hopefully engaging all of you. So Hamish, can I turn to you first, please? Thank you. And uh, thank you for inviting me to, to speak aspect. And Firstly, I'd, I'd just really like to congratulate everyone involved in, in this program. I think it's um, really, really showing a kind of step change in, in this area, which is great. And uh, I've also observed that, that since the program began, I think its aims and its relevance have, have only really increased. So um, I'd like to start with, with noting that. Um, but today I'd like to touch on, on one particular aspect of, of the future of social sciences or, or shape um, commercialization, as I probably should say. And that's the kind of measurement and the recording of success. Um, and this, I think, is a really um, live issue. And it's one that I'm exploring as part of the, the review of the knowledge exchange framework, which I've led on the development of at, at Research England. And one which um, we're really looking at um, closely, not just around shape commercialization, but measurement of these knowledge exchange interactions and these economic and societal benefits arising from um, universities collaborating with external partners um, and how we can do that better. Um, and I think one aspect of that review is a real focus on, on moving beyond how we measure success at the moment in frameworks like the CAF, but also more generally, um, and uh, how we can and develop a better, um, a better understanding of what success means in this context, and therefore better measures of success and therefore boost the visibility um, um, and recognition of, of this type of activity. So for those who are maybe unfamiliar, the Knowledge Exchange Framework um, sits alongside um, other frameworks like REF and TEF, and is designed to um, measure the, the KE performance of, of English universities, it's English only exercise at the moment, in various aspects of knowledge exchange. Um, and we've developed this framework to be largely metrics driven, which is great because it's very low burden um, and, and relatively easy to participate in. But we have had to use what metrics we have available to us at the moment. And we quite heavily rely on um, income as a proxy for impact. Now, we think this is a good proxy for a number of reasons, not least because it's um, uh, quick and easy to measure, it's easy to audit, et cetera. Um, but does it really tell us about the success or otherwise of the um, commercialization performance or indeed any other type of knowledge exchange performance. So for example, in the KEF, um, that we have some metrics which, which measure performance around IP and commercialization, which are looking at how much um, investment get leveraged into spin-outs um, or how much um, licensing income is generated from, from a university's intellectual property. Um, 
but I think this has become quite clear during the, um, you know, the aspect program and things like the social business um, model innovation report, that I'm not sure those proxies work so well when you're thinking about um, shape commercialization. So I guess my, my kind of thinking about the future is how do we move beyond income as a proxy for impact to get maybe closer to the real kind of um, societal um, benefits that some of the, the shape commercialization, um, you know, for example, the spin outs through zinc are creating. Um, and I guess there's a couple of ways of, of doing this. Um, so one is we, you can do loads of clever maths. So you can look at, um, for example, in the KEF at the moment, we recognize that, that small to medium sized enterprises can have a lower ability to pay or the public and the third sector may not pay um, for knowledge exchange in the same way as large um, multinationals. So we can, do, we can do maths to kind of equalize that. So we can get rid of the, the differing abilities to pay thing, but we're still not really getting to the core of what social enterprises are trying to deliver um, and where you have business models which don't rely on lots of venture capital. Um, so how can we move beyond this, this kind of income proxy to a better representation of that? Now that's certainly not easy and I think it comes with, with a set of challenges, not least because the benefits are realized over very long time scales often. Um, they may be quite intangible or, or otherwise very hard to measure. So what can we do about that? Um, and I think the, the generic approach we've taken to um, both looking at shape type disciplines in commercialization and more generally, is to not just look at those final kind of outcomes and impacts, but taking a step back along that kind of value chain, as it were, and thinking what kind of measures further back, um, you know, so what I call sort of trajectory measures, can we think about, um, can we think about capturing? And do they give us a better, but still you know, relatively low burden, relatively timely way of, of measuring the success of these, of these type of ventures? Um, and that's very much the approach we're taking to, to other fields. And I guess my final point is in thinking about the future of shape commercialization, um, what can we learn from um, other disciplines and other areas, uh, related things, for example, one other area we're looking at very closely in for the knowledge exchange framework is around um, universities impact on public policy. What lessons can we learn from trying to deal with those kind of um, less tangible, um, less easy to count, shall we say, um, type of outcomes that those, those interactions produce? And, and how can that also um, inform the debate on how we measure shape type commercialization going forward? So that would be my real challenge. Um, and uh, very happy to, to have a discussion about that. Thank you, Hamish, that, that was great, great introduction. Rosalind. Thank you, Jude, and thank you, Hamish. And I think like Hamish, I'm going to start by just saying thank you to the Aspect team for inviting me here today, but also for all of the great work that they do. It is such a pleasure to be part of the advisory group. And I think to sort of start thinking about the future, it's worth starting by orientating ourselves in terms of where we are today. And of course, the last 18 months have, have created a significant sort of global uh, change and, and upheaval in terms of the pandemic, but also the increasing focus on climate change and recognizing that COP26 is, is, is on the horizon and, and coming soon. And I think what we, what I find myself saying in, in various conferences all the time is that all of these events have really cast spotlight on, on the importance of research. But I think importantly, it's also cast a spotlight on the important contribution that the shaped subjects make to public policy and, and to other areas um, in terms of tackling some of these large global challenges that we're facing. I think we've learned obviously throughout the pandemic and importantly have recognized that pandemics are not just a biological phenomena, but they are a social phenomena as well. And that a lot of the measures that needed to be taken in response required a strong understanding of social behavior. Um, we understand that when we think about mental health and, and um, measures and, and um, to improve mental health, we need to better understand the social context. And that climate change, for example, requires you know, just as much focus on behavioral change as it relies on scientific and technological breakthroughs. And I think we are in this space now where we are recognizing 
the really you know fundamental critical con contribution that is made by the shape uh, disciplines in tackling these large grant challenges. But in reflecting on where we are today and, and what it says and what it brings, it does take to a kind of second observation, and this is particularly important when we think through the future, which is that I'm sure this will come out in, in previous sessions, the shape disciplines have sort of articulated less and thought less about some of the consequences or perhaps some of the contributions that they can make more widely um, to uh, building some building economic opportunity, uh, seizing commercial opportunities in collaboration with industry, working across and in collaboration with STEM subjects, but also distinct um, contributions that they're able to sort of make on their own as well. I think within disciplines, um, we do see a, a lot of work that's been put into considering the contributions that can be made to um, more widely uh, from the shape subject of thinking through commercial opportunities and enhancing collaborations with industries. But I think there's a lot that still needs to be done to kind of raise some of the public consciousness and political consciousness of the contributions that the social sciences and other shape disciplines can make more broadly to economic growth and in collaboration with industry. So I think really uh, the kind of third observation is that now is the time now is the time to really make this case very strongly because the government is really focused on the role that research can play in the um, in the, the plan for growth and the UK's longer term economic strategy, but also on a global platform, this was articulated really clearly in the integrated review. The government has already set a very clear ambition to very significantly increase um, the UK's research spend. Um, with a target to reach the equivalent of 2.4% of GDP by 2027. And this requires really quite fundamental uplifts in R&D activity across the UK. We know, of course, that the government is working on an innovation strategy at the moment, and that's going to have really important consequences for all kind of aspects and facets of R&D um, and the wider innovation system. One of the challenges that we know the innovation strategy is grappling with is that the um, industrial strategy that, that um, has kind of shaped a lot of the prioritization that we've seen over the last few years was constructed very strongly around the, the grand challenges, which covered everything from sort of climate change through to its aging society and AI and technological breakthroughs. And we think that one of the things the innovation strategy is going to seek to do is to actually untangle those issues, to talk about the grand challenges and to talk about some of these wider commercial opportunities. And the commercial opportunities in particular are being thought, thought of as a category called technologies. So I think there's a real opportunity to think through what the social sciences can do and, and what the wider shape, shape um, uh, disciplines can do to contribute, not just tackling some of these big global challenges, where I think perhaps the contribution is particularly clear in the context of global pandemic, but also to some of these kind of wider um, commercial opportunities that the UK is seeking to seize um, that are related to R&D and innovation. Thank you, Rosalind, that was really helpful. And I think the, the some of the, the comments you made about social scientists' lack of engagement are, are actually very fair and just. And, and this is why we're here, isn't it, to talk about how we, how we can change that. Mark, would you like to come in? Yes, thank you for having me. And 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 as I just want to repeat what everyone said, uh, you know, aspects of fantastic program, and uh, delighted to be part of this today. Um, I'm going to start by letting you into uh, a little bit of a secret that we've got down in Oxford, which is actually that uh, commercialisation of social science is actually a little bit easier than commercialising uh, from STEM, as you don't have all this um, equity to deal with, sort of all these massive uh, equity investment and patents to deal with, actually you can get these innovations that come from social sciences out into the, in, into the wild world relatively straightforwardly, um, because often they're more service led. But that does mean that there needs to be some differences in approach and when you're um, based in a university which is traditionally very STEM heavy, that does need, need require changes in approach and this is what is required from everybody, I think, if, if social science commercialization is going to grow in the future. Uh, the first thing I want to, uh, uh, to labor on is, is finances. Um, if you've got uh, business models which are more sort of service-led to, to begin with, certainly, 
um, you can get going with much um, smaller quantities of funding. So much more liquid product, financial products should be available. Um, so you smaller chunks. So you could be, you know, loans or convertible notes or things like that could be a really good way of getting um, social sciences uh, uh, um, companies on their way. The types of investors, the types of funders that you're looking for in those early stages um, are probably ones that look much more like the ones that you see in Dragon's Den than you would in your um, angels that uh, tr traditionally hang around um, heavily uh, life science or technology focused universities, um, you know, and that you traditionally see. Um, the other thing is, is, the sh is in the information, uh, and, and this is a point I want to label, and aspect is very key to, to do this, is just to share information um, of, of what's going on across the UK and, and, and beyond of what's going on in, in commercialization in social sciences. Because if you're going to get money of any sort, from whether it be from government, from investors, from, from, from anyone, um, to grow social sciences, you, they need to know what's going on. You need to be able to map it. Um, and then you can actually talk, put together um, arrangements and collaborations between the different universities, whether it's on a regional or a topical level, um, where, if, where, for instance, you can pool pipelines, where you can have you know, aligned um, approaches to things. So, for instance, um, social enterprise, which is one, one, one half of my job, social enterprise, um, still a very nascent area, very, um, very early stage in terms of the funding that's available compared to the mainstream. Um, if you have universities which are working together, pulling their pipeline, maybe you can read some, some funding together. Um, likewise, with, in terms of impact and impact measurement, impact measurement is very difficult. Um, I'm sure there's been talks on, on that throughout, throughout the course of the last two days. Um, but maybe we should go one step back. Maybe we should be doing impact mapping. So actually seeing where the good ideas are coming from. What, when you've got an early stage startup, it's not going to have much impact. Not yet, but you could see, if you could actually see the sorts of innovations that are going on across the country, then people who have got the funding can work out where to put their funding in order for these um, potentially really big ideas to grow. Um, so where am I going? So, so what, what we do is we need more sharing, we need, to, uh, we need more data, it needs to be rich. But it's not just data, it's information. We need to actually, we need to convert that data into, into information. We need, it needs to be useful. We need to know what is going on so we know how best to deploy the resources that we have in the most effective way to help social science commercialization grow effectively. Now I'll hand it back to the chair. That's great, Mark. I mean, I think there's been a number of points raised which, which um, we, we could unpick here. I mean, just your point about mapping. I mean, I made a note about obviously where the ideas are coming from, but, but I think there's something about reach as well, isn't there, for social science? Is that often you you think you're reaching I don't know an initiative designed for older people and of course you're reaching all the families um, who are caring for older people and you're maybe reaching grandchildren who are affected by when and where and how their their older relative is being cared for and how many days they spend out of hospital and and that could affect them in in incredible ways and then of course there's sort of communities and societal benefit of having um, particular interventions at particular times and and when you start looking at the reach of some social science initiatives or, or, or wider shape arts and humanities uh, as well as initiatives you can you really do start to get a slightly different um, sense of, of what's been achieved and Hamish can I just come back to you because there's a really interesting point about visibility and recognition for social science I mean what what what, what are the positive things that you've seen about us becoming more visible and, and could Rosalind and Mark comment on that about how we can do that job of getting ourselves out there and when we do make a contribution actually having it recognized sure yeah well, I mean it, it kind of struck me as, as as Mark was talking talking about mapping and uh, linking data together to create better information and sharing that that's almost a, another way of saying that we need to tell the story I guess there's those three things that's that storytelling in one way um, and I think I'd, I'd never underestimate the, the power of that. So, so when we're thinking about um, you know, policy and, and funding and all those type of things, I think it's that combination of, um, you know, kind of looking at the cold hard numbers and, you know, is this, is this providing return on investment? What good is it doing? 
in terms of the numbers, but then it's always great to be able to bring that to life with uh, the kind of real world, you know, what does this actually, what does it actually mean? Um, so I think anything that, that kind of boosts that, the ability to tell a really good story really boosts the visibility of this. And then, you know, at one very crude level, but more around the measurement, particularly with things like the knowledge exchange framework or um, the, the formula funding, which we use to, to fund knowledge exchange with, is if we can't measure it and we can't measure it robustly and, and transparently, it's quite hard as, a, as Research England, as a, you know, most of our funding, connecting capability fund and aspect and, and things like that aside, we are formula funders, which is tremendously efficient way of funding, um, but presents challenges when um, what you're doing isn't that amenable to easy measurement. So I guess it provides a kind of, you know, a, a pathway. And it's not just about, oh, we, we can now, you know, measure it and fund it or put it in a framework. But it, that storytelling is then becomes quite pervasive and you can build up a real you know, community and a momentum behind it, which I think is important. And there's an interesting methodological point, of course, in what you're saying is about sort of the use of mixed methods as well in social sciences, in terms of getting that reach, maybe in terms of numbers and measurable outcomes versus the storytelling, which might come from other methods, uh, which often typically involve smaller populations. And, and it is that tension, isn't it, between, uh, as you say, just having a really good number that can influence change, but then the, the societal benefit often comes through more clearly. Um, I suppose it's getting to the stage where we can tell our stories and people will listen though, isn't it? It's about finding a, a seat at the table. So Rosalind, Mark, would you like to come in on that point about how we can become more visible and how we can get listened to? I'm sure that in, in lots of, of points in, in the um, sessions that have preceded this, this um, item on the agenda, we've probably come to many of these points, but it's very important that we articulate exactly the contributions that the shape disciplines make um, to the kind of innovation process more widely. So whether that's improving a firm's processes um, or their organization, developing kind of more innovative practices to adapt to sort of changing demands, but actually also the role that the, that the shape disciplines actually play in understanding what those changing demands are. And when it comes to articulating the importance of the shape disciplines, I think to some of these kind of wider contributions to the innovation system, some of the challenges are not so dissimilar to the challenges that are faced by businesses when they try to explain how the innovation system works from their perspective. A lot of businesses will explain that actually R&D is just one small part of the R&D journey. For businesses, R&D is about, it's about purpose. It's usually about what's the benefit to the business of conducting that area of research. They want to see some commercial returns from their investment. To get that commercial return, they're not just thinking about the research as part of the R&D that they're performing. They also need to think about it's, uh, whether it's adapting to customer demands, the design of the product, the marketing of the product, the, the explanations of, of why a new product is something that should be, should be taken up and something that, that there should be excitement about. And it's in those kind of wider aspects of the innovation process for a business that many of the shape disciplines are making such valuable contributions. So I think there might actually be something in terms of collaborating with industry on articulating that broader innovation process better because actually some of the challenges are shared. A really good point, actually. But to reflect on something you said about the way that R&D is used perhaps in business and, and how it's conceptualized in universities, I think, I think maybe it's about establishing trusting relationships, isn't it, between the two organizations? Because of course our research doesn't necessarily give easy answers. It doesn't certainly give the answer that maybe uh, is required or, or desired. And, and we certainly do not gear our methods or our, um, our questions up to, to suit uh, a commercial advantage. So having said that, um, at the same time, it has real integrity and it has real value because it can also, you know, maybe there's some uncomfortable truths, um, but um, they're worth knowing. Uh, and so I think it is about that partnership building as well, isn't it? And establishing those relationships where, where both sides can see and really see the advantage. 
Mark, would you like to come in on that point? Or? Yeah, yeah, partnerships are a big thing, and it doesn't harm for the big institutions as well to big up the uh, the social sciences agenda uh, in terms of pushing the the agenda forward. Um, I think the social sciences has a really good opportunity as well with something which is becoming increasingly relevant, which is which are the sustainable development goals, which is something that I've been playing with uh, a lot over the last um, nine months as part of an Innovate UK project. And um, at the at the top, uh, at the very top level, they don't seem to um, play that they're very quite they're quite general. But if you actually look at the the actual goal level, uh, eleven, arguably twelve of the seventeen sustainable development goals are directly uh, relevant to social sciences uh, and there are an awful lot of methodologies and solutions that can be used to um, to, to make an, um, an improvement um, towards the the targets but the the key thing is that the it's not necessarily the goals themselves it's actually the indicators if you get down to the uh, indicator level of the sustainable development goals and actually to the geographical area of those sustainable uh, development uh, goal indicators you can actually start telling a very good story and you could in so a startups may be commercializing um, a methodology for bringing people out of poverty in say um, central america you could actually see that working in central america but you can also see how that methodology can be applied elsewhere you can see and you can use that information which is wrapped up in these indicators which in themselves tell a story as to how that intervention can be used elsewhere as well. It's a really good handle that social sciences could use to tell the story. And I, I, I think there's a, an awful lot in it. I think that's a really good point actually, Mark. So some of my work is, is overseas, um, particularly um, in uh, uh, around international development. And often it's not even just the methods that you could transfer, it's the knowledge and the practice and the understanding. So my, my research is in health and, um, you know, looking at the way in which healthcare practitioners manage resources, budget, mm -hmm. deal with, you know, pernicious issues related to um, anyone living on low income, you know, which could be, you know, a, a pernicious health, health issue, but it could be domestic violence, or it, it could be, um, you know, dealing with troublesome teens, whatever it is. These, these are, you know, I think the sustainable de development goals tell us these are universal global problems. Um, and some of the solutions will arise in the global south. Um, for uh, and could be learned from by the global north and I think we have to think about knowledge flows uh, to make sure that all the different communities are all listening and all sharing and I, I think that's been a really great theme for me from this session has been the importance of getting the information out there articulating it in a way that businesses and uh, and academics and, and publics can understand readily understand and adopt and, and learn from and then making sure it's shared making sure that there's no particular barriers to to people implementing change now this is the part of the session where we could move on to q a but we haven't actually got any questions in the q a so can i encourage you um, to, to put questions in the Q&A, but I also wondered if our panellists, I mean, I've got more questions, but have you got questions for each other as well, given that we're, we're all in the room and we've all got this opportunity to, to talk? Well, I was quite interested in, in Mark's assertion that, that social science spinning out shape um, companies was easy because you didn't have to worry about um, IP and patents and, and, and equity. But that's not true in, in all cases, is it? And, and also, in some ways, that's a kind of maybe a, a blessing and a curse, because if you look at the way companies tend to be valued and, and therefore, you know, how, how they can attract investment, um, you know, intellectual property plays a part in that. So I just wondered if that was, you know, it's not true in all cases. And, and does it does it present difficulties as well with things like valuation or indeed, um, you know, convincing anyone to invest because there's quite low barriers to entry because you don't have the, the IP protection? Well, 80% of the UK economy is services, uh, and only 20% of it is is based on on technology. And it's been the approach of the of the universities over the last 25 years to focus on the 20% rather than the 80%, right? Um, and you know, there's 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 a lot of misnomers about about, about social science. Well, about um, service like companies, you know, that that they're not scalable. Well, tell tell me if KPMG scaled or not. You know, it's there, there's what what I mean about um, uh, about social science commercialization is is the nature of getting going. Yes, it, it's it may be difficult 
we may need to develop different metrics on how to measure uh, what success is. Uh, but in terms of actually getting your ideas and your services out there, it's easier because you can just get out there and start providing it. You, uh, normally, you know, so, so, so everything I'm seeing here is sweeping generalizations because we know that social sciences covers everything from archaeology to you know, economics to you name it. It's, it goes across the board. And there's mixtures of, of hardness of intellectual property uh, across the piece. Um, but in, in general, what have we found so far in Oxford is that you start by um, a very sort of one-on-one -on -one, um, service, which is provided to other large corporations or to, or to individuals or to institutions. And on that, you sort of then develop a, a, a product which, uh, where you start providing the same thing over and over again. And then you start bringing in technology to assist the scaling of providing that to more and more people at a lower and lower cost. Because you're bringing in income right from the very start, rather than having to, for instance, if you're doing technology, which, which may, you may not get a penny into your, into your company uh, for selling a product until you were acquired or, or until you IPO, I'm sorry, I think that's easier. I think that's an easier way of actually getting the ideas out there and testing. I think, you, I think you've got more barriers, but they are lower. I think find, getting the access to the right finance I think the, the, the quantification of risk, at the, as particularly in the early stages of the development of the company, um, I don't think we've actually we've managed to work out um, what that is yet. But I, I'm seeing companies coming out of Oxford, they're, they're getting going and they're turning over a few tens of thousands a year, and maybe maybe in a two or three years down the line they'll be able to, to do in, in the hundreds of thousands. I've got one or two which are already doing seven figures. These so. Yes, you might have steadier growth um, and you might not need investment. Um, and it might be something which is more difficult to count. But in terms of actually building a company, most companies are built like this. It's a really good point, Hamish. Do you want to come back on that point or? Yeah, no, I know, I know you know, sort of de deliberately you know, playing devil's advocate a bit there with, with the IP question. The other thing that strikes me is that we often, you know, particularly in kind of, you know, um, STEM-based um, university spin-outs or startups, you talk a lot about the ecosystem and access to finance and things like that, and you compare the relative easy availability of, of um, um, access to finance in, in Oxford or the southeast of England compared to the north of England, for example. So I wonder if, if you'd have any reflections on the importance of place when you're, when you're starting these, these type of ventures. And, maybe that's less important for social sciences and shape type commercialization than it is for life sciences where you may need that ecosystem around you. How important is the ecosystem? Uh, yes, I think place is important. Um, and uh, I think that, so, so God, I could answer that so many different ways. Um, let's take social enterprise for us. So let's, um, I, I'm going to make, give you a stat, which is half of social science spin-outs at Oxford are social enterprises, which it wouldn't be surprising given the, the nature of the things that uh, social scientists on average uh, research into. Um, the social impact capital is, ge uh, is generally concentrated in London. It doesn't even get as far as Oxford. Um, and so if you want to get access to, to that sort of finance, you have to get, get down to, to London in order to get that, which means actually building infrastructure around Oxford um, is actually quite difficult when you're trying to get things going. Um, so this, uh, so, so yes, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, there wasn't that much uh, access to finance around Oxford in STEM. Um, and so there were the, um, the angel ne networks were built by the university and things like that. With social science, you're going to have to do the same sort of thing. You're going to have to, and, and I don't think it's something that should be done by just like the big universities by themselves. I think, it, it, I think it's much better if, if universities regionally got together, started sharing their pipelines, um, pooling their pipelines, and building um, networks of funders and, and investors on the back of that. And that's going to take a lot of work to do. And, and, I, th and I think this is a recognised issue. I mean, we talked a little bit earlier about um, one pot potential, you know, very valuable impact is influencing policy. And that can be done through legislation or it can be through uh, more local policy. And certainly in Scotland, we do talk about the fact that we have, you know, more access to government because it's a small country um, and, and we have that closer access. 
in, in other universities in, in England, I know that, you know, if you're not part of the sort of London Southeast bubble, actually, in, you know, influencing policy is, is regarded as that much more difficult, just a simple proximity. We do actually have a question, and um, I think it's to all of us, it's from Orla, um, but I wonder if we could start with you, Rosalind. So it's, can you comment on the former ISCF and hopes for future, oh, and, and also Hamish, of course, future challenge funding from UKRI and how social sciences fits into that? So I guess a few, I'm sure Hamish has many, many thoughts on this as well. So I'll be seeing to hand over to him. But um, I think these are incredibly important funding streams that are already delivering some really tangible impacts and successes. Um, there's a real kind of area of, of focus clearly emerging in the innovation strategy, which aligns quite strongly with this agenda. So it doesn't feel like it's going away sort of anytime soon. But I think one of the challenges that we sometimes find with the shaped subjects is that their value is, is often um, sort of defined in, in their collaboration with other disciplines, including primarily the STEM disciplines. And there is something to be done, I think, in terms of reflecting on what can be achieved through the collaboration of disciplines that are supported by schemes such as those, but also the standalone contributions that are made particularly by the shape disciplines to those projects, making sure, as, as we talked about before, in terms of the emotions, that can be being able to talk about, share good stories and positive stories about the contributions of those disciplines, finding ways to sort of extract those individual discipline contributions to those projects. So that we can tell those stories and we can shout about them effectively. Thank you, Rose. And that, that's very helpful. And Hamish, would you like to come in as well? So I have to just make it clear that I, I don't speak for UKRI. We're, you know, Research England's one council in UKRI. In many ways, we're not so close to that kind of um, you know, uh, challenge led funding. Um, I, I'm also not in a position to talk in detail about forthcoming strategies and you know, in particular the innovation strategy and, and things like that. I think what I would say more generally is um, a lot of what you see uh, around the challenge led funding is it's very obvious that, that shape disciplines will play an enormous role in that. Um, you know, so for example, net zero, you know, just as Rosalind said, the, the pandemic is as much about um, the social aspects as the biological. You know, so is so is net net zero and, and a lot of the, the things in that. Um, so then, I guess two kind of questions or challenges then is around the um, so clearly shape shape disciplines have a role in in tackling these big kind of innovation challenges. Um, but then, I guess the the kind of question or issue is around the nature of the relationships between. Um, you know who you know who leads and, and equitable relationships, um, and also thinking about shape and unpacking that. Um, whilst you know sort of role of economists or, or social scientists of, of various types might have a very obvious and easy kind of way in to those kind of challenges and well-established means of working with other disciplines to address them. Um, we can't forget about things like um, um, the arts, where there may be less obvious ways, but no less valuable ways that they could get involved. So I think it's there's, there's clearly a, a huge role for, for um, social sciences and, and um, humanities and arts to contribute to these challenges, particularly as around they, they move away from uh, you know purely kind of economic challenges to these kind of you know, problems facing the world. It becomes even more relevant. Um, let's make sure that disciplines aren't, aren't being left behind or don't suffer inequitable relationships in, you know, with, with, between disciplines or in terms of their involvement or potential to access that funding. Mm. And that is going to be a bit of a shift in the landscape, though, isn't it? Because, I mean, I'm part of a number of, of interdisciplinary projects and, and everyone's CV looks slightly different. Um, you know, there's often in the arts, humanities and social sciences, there's a lot more emphasis on say writing a monograph or a book 
And there's really good reasons why we invest the time to do that. I mean, uh, partly to relate to our teaching, but um, also because that's um, you know highly valued in our, in our spheres. Um, you don't often see books, but you'll see reams and reams and reams of journal articles all published in the last year on, on somebody perhaps from a STEM discipline. So sometimes when we're looking at the, if you like the value of somebody's contribution, it's not always evident to people from other disciplines. Um, you know, we need to get literacies, don't we, so that we can uh, read and appreciate and assess, I'm thinking as, as panellists or um, uh, awarding bodies, uh, to make sure that we, we understand the value of something that's maybe led by somebody from another discipline, um, who will be asking different questions. And there's a big difference between asking perhaps, a, you know, a, a STEM collaboration, bringing in somebody from the arts, humanities, and social sciences to help them answer the question that they've identified. Again, they might not have started from there. They might be asking very different questions and they might be looking to STEM colleagues or, or, or you know, other, dis other social science disciplines to provide a different kind of input. So we, we will have to adjust, won't we? We can't just carry on business as usual. No, and I think, you know, again, this is, this is sort of a, a personal opinion and not the view of UKRI, but I think one of the promises of UKRI when it was created in 2018 was to bring together also the various research councils and, and Research England and, and Innovate UK. Um, and you know, I think we have a role to play in acting in a, in a more joined up way. And you see um, bits of that through, for example, um, um, moves towards harmonization of impact acceleration accounts and things like that which may make that kind of cross-disciplinary working more easy. Um, and again, a you know, personal opinion around um, assessment of this is that, um, you know, I think one of the strengths of the REF is, is you can, it doesn't really matter about your discipline, there's still potential to be recognised in the same way. And one of the, the pleasures of my job, I'm sitting in the, in the building that houses the REF library at the moment, um, and that, that's a really great thing to wander around at, at a lunchtime and just see all the, those outputs that, that aren't journal papers. And it's really quite, um, quite interesting. We can talk about REF at this point in the cycle. It's not quite as touchy as it was a few months ago, but thank you. Mark, did you want to come in on that point about um, ISCF and, and uh, the way funding works? Well, I mean, I, th I think one of the ideas that's bouncing around um, at the moment is actually to take the individual councils out of it altogether with regard to impact acceleration awards. Um, now, uh, the, the, you know, Oxford, I don't know how it works for other universities, but they, they get a block grant from, from the research councils for impact acceleration awards. Oxford uh, goes in with three other universities for the, for the ESRC, um, and, it, and it takes one from the EPSRC. And last time round, I think we got 25 times more impact acceleration funding for, from EPSRC than we did for ESRC. Now, um, and whilst I don't think the two need to be equal, um, maybe the best thing to do is, is and, and particularly um, taking, um, including interdisciplinary stuff, is why, why not just pull it all into one big impact acceleration account? And it'll be for the universities themselves to decide how they need to um, sort the, the funding out between the two, between its um, constituent departments. I think that that would sort of solve um, or kill two birds with one stone, which might enable the universities themselves to balance up the discrepancies between the funding that, that's required to accelerate ideas. And also it makes it far easier for um, other department, departments to work with each other. And, and it speaks to the, the point that was made right at the beginning, and I think it was also your point, Rosalind, was about we have to make sure that when we start our research, we actually do think about the end game, about what the impact might be, which we're not always great at doing. We're very good at thinking about the report or the publication, but beyond that, we, we need sometimes stretch ourselves so that when we come to the compete for IA money with other disciplines, we've got a good case. And, and so maybe this will help us, you know, sort of sharpen, sharpen our skills. And, and I do think there's a lot we could learn from STEM colleagues in this space. I mean, in terms of our partnerships in social sciences, often we have, you know, fantastic networks for government, uh, NGOs, um, you know, local government in particular, we, we work you know, absolutely hand in hand with charities. We, we're, we're, we're very good at the not-for-profit, but we're, we're less good at making um, partnerships with companies. 
we can do it in, in sort of contingent terms, but do we do we invest in them over over time? And I think experience is showing us that you you can't just look around when you know some fantastic call comes from Innovation uh, UK to to find a partner. These partnerships need to have been developed, maintained, sustained over time, um, and maybe that's something we could all be investing in a, a little bit more in in the social sciences. That's the only question I've got from the floor. Are there any other questions that anyone would like to come in and ask, either through the, the Q&A function or you're very welcome to put things in the chat? So panel, is there anything else that's on your mind that you would, you would like to, to ask one another? Is there anything that, that, that calls to you? I was, I was really interested, Hamish, in your sort of opening remarks about measuring success. I think that's, that is a really, a really key area for us to potentially explore just a little bit further. And I think it, it's um, it's interesting to see how much progress is being made in, in the aspect of program of work and, and how that's how that is all progressing. But it doesn't the outputs of that work don't necessarily materialize in some of the, the ways in which we're capturing success at the moment. And it's kind of well understood that even sort of within a lot of the STEM disciplines, different KE channels have different levels of importance. So whether that's sort of patenting and licensing in the material sciences or contracts and collaborative research in engineering, when we look at some of the shape subjects, perhaps some of those benefits actually materialize more in the flow of human capital or between um, universities and, and industry. And I'd be quite interested in whether you had any any thoughts really on, on how perhaps some of those forms of, of knowledge exchange could be better captured? Yeah, definitely. And I think that kind of relates to the point I was trying to make towards the end of my kind of introductory um, notes around the fact that I think it's good to learn from other, you know, how, how other people do this. So I, I, as many people will know, I'm a big fan of saying, you are not special. Um, and um, I don't think in, in some ways you know, social, you know, social sciences are special as are, you know, uh, you know, as are STEM and everything else. But I think there's more which is common than um, unique a lot of the time. And I think there is a tendency to, to go away and try and, uh, you know, reinvent some kind of special way. And ultimately, that's that's only going to have limited success because when you're dealing with researching, you know, someone like researching them are relatively, for most of the time, kind of discipline agnostic in, in terms of funding. We have to find ways of working around that. So I think um, things like um, flows of human capital, uh, staff mobility, how um, practice informs research and that really sort of genuine two-way knowledge exchange, um, um, influencing public policy. I think that's relevant to all disciplines as well. So then I guess it becomes thinking about um, uh, having frameworks of, of measurement, which are which are a complete, so that everyone has a chance to to um, you know be recognised in, in that, um, and b kind of nuanced and adaptable enough to say where there are large differences that they can be taken into account somehow. Um, but I would say um, it becomes fearsomely complicated to try and think at a, a university disciplinary level about how to do different things for different disciplines. And I think it's quite a dangerous route because that takes you down the route of um, potentially having to place more importance on one thing and another. So I think, you know, as, as we've done in, in, the, in the knowledge exchange framework, we tried to kind of, um, every kind of perspective of knowledge exchange we look at, we'd be that IP and commercialization or public and community engagement. Then we're not saying we value one mode of knowledge exchange above another. So I think the more important thing is the completeness of the recording and the ability of institutions in those type of frameworks to be able to demonstrate um, you know, their particular strengths and their particular strategic priorities as kind of sensible, diverse, autonomous institutions. Yeah, I must say as a social scientist, I've absolutely welcomed the, the acknowledgement of influencing uh, policy and practice and also engaging with with wider organizations not just sort of industry in, the, in a way that it was quite narrowly defined at one point I mean I think that's really opened up the possibilities for us and and you're right we're, we're great at dealing with uh, you know engaging with policy and engaging with publics and just as we could learn from STEM perhaps on the commercialization I do think 
partnering with social sciences, arts and humanities uh, will be very beneficial for a lot of, of STEM colleagues. And I think as well, what that will do hopefully is break down some of the very stereotypical ideas that people have. So social scientists, oh, they're just interested in ideas. They're not really interested in commercialization or impact, real world impact. That's not true. But then, you know, also, I think social scientists are very um, likely to regard people in STEM disciplines as being science focused and not interested in societal impact. And that's not true. So I do think these, these, you know, these, there's lots of places to have these conversations and, and, and uh, to be on the same platform. And then we'll realize actually that you're right. Maybe, maybe we're, not, we're not very special after all and, and our concerns are our shared concerns and our, and our opportunities um, can be maximized. Mark, do you want to come in on that point? We're, we're, we're nearly at the end, but it'd be great to hear your, your views. I could talk for about three hour, four hours <laughs> on the impact measurement, but anyway, um, uh, I, I'm sort of, you know, I'm a bit of a, a few controversial opinions on impact measurement. I mean, I, I think the, I, I think what we should be, feel, a lot of, a lot of impact measurement is, is focused on, um, on contribution. One of the things is, um, uh, to what extent is, uh, would the innovation of, would the solution have happened anyway, um, had that funding or had that service not happened at all? Now, if you're working in the world of startup, the answer is, is normally, Yes, it would have happened anyway, because if you have, if you're not in an industry where there is is competition, um, then 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 you're probably doing the wrong thing. It, all, this contribution is one of the big problems with impact measurement, which is stopping people doing it in the yeah. first. Place. And I much prefer uh, doing the doing the measurement of the actual result. What effect have you had with the thing that you have done? And that, and I think once. Once we, if we can just start measuring that very simple thing first, and then get an awful lot of data of the effects that people have had, and then we can start worrying about how effective the funding was or how effective the methodology was compared to everyone else. Once we've got an awful lot of data, we're still in very early stages yet with all of this. Now, I, I really do like results-driven um, methodologies, which is why I quite like the SDG indicators because they're all about results. They're all about. Yeah. What are your targets? What are you trying to get to do? And it works just as well in central Birmingham as it does in Bahrain. So I, I think it's I think it's a really good thing to do. And I would like to see more of that um, in terms of metrics as the ref, kef, and tef and everything else moves forward. But with that I essential the, um, story. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Hey Mitch. Oh, well, I was going to mention uh, you know, Mark's Mark's mentioning of the SDGs. The reason I like them is because they're not about the internal structures or you know, disciplines or differences between disciplines. The, the very essence of knowledge exchange is that, you know, it, by definition, you have to have this external partner and this economic or societal benefit. And I think whilst in some cases it's, it's useful and beneficial to, to measure the internal stuff, actually what matters is, is the effect on those partners. Um, so, you know, it doesn't really matter how you get there as long as that that effect happens. So I would completely agree with Mark on that basis. I agree. And I, I must admit, I use the SDGs all the time simply because, I mean, I would ally with social science with all 17. I, I would say we're, we're in all of them. And also, I would, you know, it, they're the universal language that allow us to talk to partners about common challenges and common goals without it becoming a country centered or a locale or even you know, something that's maybe a, a slightly colonial agenda about development. So I, I think they're, they're doing us all a fantastic service. And the more the UK recognizes that they have issues in all of those areas too, that they're not restricted to other parts of the globe, we can move on. Martin, you've put a question in the chat um, and you're talking about um, Nesta's five stages of impact measurement. Um, could somebody comment on that? It's, I think it's to all panelists. Just in the last few seconds. Nesta's five stages of impact measurement is not something I'm familiar with, I'm afraid, Martin. Is this, is this the who, what, um, how, how much, all that, is it that one? <laughs> I can't, I can't, we don't know. <laughs> but I'm sure it's a very, very useful measure. I'm, sorry. I, I, I'm not familiar with it either, but I, I would agree with the principles of um, you know, light, manageable, um, don't try and measure things to death, um, especially where it's very long and complicated to do, and look for the commonalities and look for what's common across uh, you know, different, different things rather than, than maybe what's unique and, 
and, and lovely, but not very useful from a practical perspective. And we also talked about scalability, didn't we? And, and one of the things that we've certainly been discussing at Glasgow is, is actually, you know, researchers like me, I'm, I'm a social anthropologist by background, we often look at the micro, um, but often the ideas we have are scalable. Um, we just never look beyond that, that particular locality, so we need to do more work there. I'm going to start to, to draw things to a close just because we're running out of time, but it's been a, a great discussion and I hope, I hope our audience have, have followed us and, and, and enjoyed it too. And, and please do um, send, send this link to colleagues if you, if you think that they would also um, benefit from, from hearing the, the panellists. So we have another session that we could all join. Uh, I know Julia Black is, is wrapping up the festival, but a tremendous thanks to our panelists today with, uh, you know, to Hamish, to Rosalind and to Mark. Uh, and thank you so much uh, for giving up your time and your expertise. And I think these are conversations we need to have more often. I think we should carry the conversations on in, in whatever fora that we find ourselves in. And I'm certainly, you know, to our participants, please, please also carry these conversations on in your own organisations. And thank you very much to attend for attending. And thank you as well to Jeannie and Kate, who are behind the scenes, who've been uh, made it all possible with Sean. So thank you very much to the Aspect team as well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.